So. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, wait. This is not uncomfortable, but it's very weird. This is the thing? This is the one. Absolutely. And now it almost couldn't have happened in a better way. Where do you want to be? So it was just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> am I funny? Now if I go over here, am I still funny? I don't see it five years from now that you're not my most famous friend. You really have to commit to something. Good to have something pushing you. That's that cool. That was really cool. Yeah, it might be cool. This is On the Cusp. Hello, I'm Ben Green, and welcome to On the Cusp. This week, my guest is Lauren McGuire. She's a writer on the UCB mod team, New Money, a contributor to Wits Radio on NPR, and she's on the writing staff of the IFC show, Comedy Bang Bang. A quick reminder that you can go to lots of different places to find new episodes of On the Cusp. You can find it on Stitcher, SoundCloud, and iTunes. And if you don't subscribe to the show already, I recommend that you start doing that because that's a fun way to have new episodes come right to you whenever they come out. This episode of On the Cusp is sponsored by Thai Pepper at 6219 Franklin Avenue. If you've been thinking about going to Thai Pepper but need a final push, you might want to check out some of their awesome reviews on Yelp. Amy K writes... Fried rice is the bomb, yo. Totes would go back. Stephanie H. says, If you like it spicy, they will add it and you won't be disappointed. And according to Ryan C., Thai pepper has great food, great food. One of my favorite Penangs. And this is coming from a guy who has not one or two, but eight friends on Yelp. Thai pepper. Really, really liked by Amy K. and Stephanie H. Loved by Ryan C. It's Thai pepper. So I met Lauren McGuire at the beginning of 2013 when I got put on the UCB sketch team, New Money. And in addition to being an incredibly kind person, Lauren is one of the best writers I've met out here in LA. Uh, At the end of New Money shows, when people are buzzing about what their favorite sketches of the show are, I can't tell you how much of the time the sketch they're talking about is Lauren's. Um, She has such a high batting average of writing sketches that are both inspired and actually saying something. One of the most surprising things that I learned in my interview with Lauren is that she's struggled with anxiety throughout her whole life and actually like felt cripplingly shy growing up. Um, this was especially interesting to me because I was added to New Money after they'd already been around for a year. I was the newest writer in the writer's room and when I was added, I felt really shy. Um, and felt like it took a lot of audacity to say any of my ideas in a room with five writers who had been doing this for longer than I had and who I felt like were better than me. Um, And so I felt like I'd have to muster a lot of courage to say anything and often had trouble mustering that courage. I, I sometimes still do. But Lauren's been incredibly encouraging about speaking up um, and about actually saying the thing in the room um, and not being afraid that it's going to be a dumb thing, even if it ends up being dumb, um, instead of regretting not saying anything and worrying about not having said enough later. Um, I used to think that Lauren was giving that encouragement as a really confident person um, her whole life, but knowing that she's struggled with shyness herself too, uh, makes it feel all the more meaningful. So, let's get into it. Here is my interview with the incredibly funny, the often inspiring, Lauren McGuire. So you worked at Bang Bang today? Mm-hmm. I feel like I've got the conception that like if I had a s- job staffed on a TV show, every morning I'd wake up like really excited to go. Um, yeah. Does that is that end up being true? When the guests, when we have cool guests, it's super exciting. Like when we have Maya, like we know Maya Rudolph, Rudolph is going to be on and it's like, oh boy, <laughs> this is my dream hero. I love her so much. Do you still get gonna... nervous about yeah. meeting something like that? Yeah, and I, some, I mostly don't meet them. I usually just sit in the back and quietly admire them. 
I'm not at the point where I can go up to him and be like, hey, I wrote this bit. Kiss me on the mouth. Who have been the three biggest deals for you to meet? Or to be, like, just around? On my very first day, um, I'm, I just came in and... Uh, uh, Nick Offerman was there, and he he, he approached me, and he was so nice. <sighs> he was so, and he had lunch with everybody, like he had lunch with the crew, which is unusual. He was so sweet. He said he looked, I looked like Lena Dunham, which I take as a compliment. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's cool. Yes. Is he like a huge guy in person? No, he's just, he's just like he's very regular and sweet. Okay, and nice. cool. Yeah. I feel like he'd be like a big intimidating presence. No, that's really the mo- nice I think the most intimidating presence was uh, Little John. Is that a rapper? Yeah. He was just very cool. I don't know any rappers. That's one of but them. He, but he sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of them. We also had Schoolboy Q. That's another rapper. I didn't know him. and I had to look him up. But is it ironic that he has the word Lil in his name? Like Lil John is pretty big? I don't know. I didn't <laughs> ask him that. I should have asked him. A lot of questions. He kept wanting to... Uh, to say like cunt and stuff like he kind oh. of wanted to throw bad words in <laughs> which is which is appropriate but yeah do you feel like you <laughs> you have any responsibility to keep a guy like little john in check if he wants I think to Scott, be Scott rude took that on himself yeah. okay. <laughs> to be like hey let's do one with where we don't say cunt <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe it's just, fine maybe well, just to like, have it'll be a fun alt <laughs> yeah we can bleep it out it's not a big deal but um So, were you born in Florida originally? Yes. Born in Florida. Uh, Originally born in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Lived there for three years and then moved to Daytona Beach. When you were three? Yeah. Do you have any memories of it or just a place that you knew you were? It's just a place I knew I was. I don't really have any memories of Jacksonville. But I've been there a lot since. Who, what were your parents like? Like, what are they like? Like, Yeah, what are, what are they like? What were they doing, like, when you were a baby? And okay. What my... were the circumstances leading up to <laughs> your birth? Oh, the circumstances leading up to my birth. Well, I guess my parents had sex. <laughs> no, um, my mom was staying home with, with me and my, my brother, who's about three and a half years older than me, so she had her hands full with us. My dad did stuff I still don't really understand, but it has to do with cable and telemarketing. He's, like, yeah, like what? Like he's a telemarketer? No, like he like owns the centers that do telemarketing. Oh, calls, cool. That makes I don't know if that makes sense or not, and I honestly don't know if that's accurate. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's the like closest the closest you've way I'll ever be able to understand what he what he used to do. <laughs> Have you tried to pry and like uh, ask? Yeah, him? but I think it's above my intellectual capability to understand. <laughs> I feel the same way about my brother, his job, where he has explained it to me a thousand times, and I still. It has something to do with eBay. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> How did your parents meet? They met... Uh, oh, my gosh. They met in Connecticut, where they're both from. My mom worked at Dunkin' Donuts at, a, at the drive-thru. Whoa. And he saw her. Uh, <laughs> and it was, you know, he'd, like, chat her up every morning when he got his donuts. And then he, I think he must have seen her somewhere else and asked her on a date. And the rest is history, baby. That's really sweet. Your mom was your dad's donut lady. Donut lady. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> um, my parents are going to hear this and be like, Lauren, that's not what happened at all. I'm like, well, this was what I pieced together. <laughs> not much more than a donut lady. They, then they moved to Washington State, uh, and then they moved to Florida. All, do, all do, you, jobs do you go to Connecticut? Like, yeah, my whole to... extended family is there, so and I go there a lot. What area? Hartford, Connecticut. I'm just my family's from Connecticut. Oh. Um, in like Bethel and Orange and but I know Hartford. Yeah, that I'm not really familiar with any other. No, I. But it's not. It's not Hartford, really that. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna know yeah. what the words mean. Um, so what? So you moved to where when you were three? To Daytona Beach. Daytona Beach. Where and that's I lived where you out. were... Yeah, yeah. Forever? Forever, mm-hmm. And what were you like as a kid? Um, I had a lot of anxiety, and I was really weird and creative and nervous all the time, and, like, but not... It wasn't, like, trauma-based or anything. Like, it wasn't, like, oh, I had a bad childhood, so I'm... Ang-. Like, I just was born with a lot of anxiety. 
if, if that makes any sense. You don't feel like you were nervous about anything in particular, or what were no, the No, I mean, I'd fixate on different stuff. Like, I would fixate on, like... When I was little, it was like I'd fixate on like, oh, I'm going to go to hell or whatever. Or then I'd be fixating like as a teenager, then I'd be fixating on my body or and it just like moved from one thing to another. So with like a hell fixation, would you just be up like late at night yeah, worrying about that? Yeah, I would. I would think about and I'd think about how pointless it was. And like as a little kid, like because I remember hearing stories about the apocalypse and and idiot adults on TV saying that it was real and going to happen within our lifetime and really thinking like what's the point of being alive why should I be alive if we're just gonna die in an apocalypse yeah great question yeah <laughs> and <laughs> and so I was ve- like very anxious about that kind of stuff and anxious about like things that didn't make sense like nuclear war and well I guess it was the, the 80s ish but did your parents comfort you and go like like did they tell you that hell wasn't a thing no, they didn't tell me the hell wasn't a thing because I still went to church. Okay. Um, so you had everybody t- like <laughs> saying, "Oh no, yeah, yeah, this is my, a, this is half fifty fifty. <laughs> my parents. It's gonna be pretty bad for you. My parents are pragmatically religious. They're not like fire and brimstone or anything. My mom goes to church. She's like the account. Like she does their paperwork at the church every Sunday, and it really helps her. And that's the, uh, like perfect for her. Uh, but like when you're just a little kid and you don't understand like realistic s- stories versus parables and you just think all of it's true it's very very confusing and then i'm sure my my poor mom was like i don't know what is wrong with this kid <laughs> like, why can't you just like be like the other kids and ignore the the stuff that the fire and brimstone stuff like everybody else but i really picked in on that i really thought we were all going down in a fiery blaze i'm sorry that yeah <laughs> Um, are there any stories that you feel like are good, uh, like representations of what you were like as a kid that your family tells? I have one sad one. I do have a, a sad ver- version of that, but then I have funny ones, so I'll tell funny ones later. But the sad one is that uh, when I was a kid around kindergarten, my parents were getting divorced, and uh, I wouldn't talk about it, and so I internalized a lot of the stress, and I, I lost my hair, like on the top of my head. And everybody thought it was alopecia, and I was going to all these doctors, and the doctors were telling my parents that it was never going to grow back and all this stuff. And then finally my mom took me to a psychologist, and they were like, oh, is she, are you guys, what's going on in her home life? And they figured out that it was just stress-related. Like, my hair fell out stress-related. And But the going to kindergarten on the first day, my, my mom um, let me, that she got special permission for me to wear, like, a little baseball hat. And I wore it the first day, and then the next day I told her, I um, don't want to wear it because it's not who I am. And so I just decided that to go without the hat and explain it to everybody that I just didn't have hair. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> my hair came back, though. It's looking great. You can't see it on the podcast, but it looks fantastic. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> I'll attest. Um, that's very bizarre to me because I think of you as, like, just in the way you act yeah. out to people, you seem like a very cool like person oh well thank you i've only been working on it for 29 years <laughs> but so it's it's like fine and not like somebody yeah who, you don't wear say, being stressed out i would say that i'm if you saw me t- 10 to 12 years ago you wouldn't know that i'm the same person wow yeah well i'm, I'm excited to hear about that <laughs> later what's a what, do you have a funny story yeah to go, uh, okay with i that? have a funny story my my dad uh my dad has was an alcoholic, and he's has been sober for like twenty five years or something. Crazy, Very good setup awesome. to a funny story. Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but he used to tell me the uh, he used to tell me jokes and then have me repeat them to like his his bar friends, and the joke that he taught me was, um, "Hey, did you hear about the man with five penises? His pants fit him like a glove." Oh my god! That's a joke, <laughs> and it would get such a a great laugh and a great response every time I did it for his friends that I started telling it to like my grandma at family reunions and I got in trouble for telling it at school and uh but I loved that I was like why are these people getting my jokes man (laughs) yeah this works this kills this kills in other rooms uh so I think that might be when I learned to love making people laugh (laughs) Uh, were you a good 
student in like elementary school to middle school? Yeah, it was super good. Um, and nobody like nobody had to make me. I just like wanted to be good at it. There was no pressure from your parents. You were just that was something uh, yeah. natural in you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? And I still feel that way. Like I, I want to please people. <laughs> it, especially authority figures. You can't think of uh, anything that it came from other than like, um, even like a, a negative catalyst that would make you be that way. You, you feel um, like it really was just completely inborn. I think it was inborn and I think I, I'm, I am very afraid of yelling. Like I don't like when people yell at me and I think it's partially cause I was never yelled at when I was a kid. There was no yelling in my house, even though my parents divorced and everything, there wasn't a lot of yelling. So, uh, so it's very shocking to get yelled at or called out and have everybody look at you in the class. So I would just like be always be on my best behavior. A little teacher's pet. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you have one sibling? I have or? an older brother and then a half sister uh, who's 13. So what, what's your relationship like with both of them? My older brother, we kind of didn't get along so, not that we didn't get along, but, but we're very different personalities, and I think especially during my childhood, um, he's very he's like a lot more outgoing, and he's so he was kind of off doing his own thing. Uh, but now we're much closer. Uh, I think he's the coolest. Cool. He's a cool older brother. <laughs> and I have a thirteen year old sister. That's my dad and my stepmom's kid, and she looks a lot like me and she's very musically talented and she loves oh god she's gonna be pissed if i don't remember the name of this this pop singer that she loves not carly ray jepson i know i was just talking about her but um demi lovato demi. she loves demi lovato my sister loves demi lovato <laughs> she's a big fan it's all she texts me about one time she texted me at like four in the morning to tell me something about Demi Lovato. You've got to get Demi Lovato on Comedy Bang Bang. I know. If I didn't, she, she would, my dad would fly her out, I'm sure. When you were in, like, elementary school and middle school, were, was there any feeling yet that, like, comedy would be something that you would want to go into? Yeah, I think so. Um, because I loved... I was the only like little kid that I knew that loved SNL and would watch every episode and knew all their names and sh especially like the Molly Shannon Sherry Sherry era. Yeah. Um, Were you watching? I don't know those where I got this from. Friends or like would you like what would be your SNL watching habits? You would like come home after school and watch SNL. I would s either stay up to watch it or you know sometimes they they play reruns of it or you know on Comedy, Uncom on Comedy yeah. Central. I watched a lot of them from Comedy Central when they would air the older ones. Uh, so I and specifically, I wanted I was like I want to write on that show. Not I want to act on that show, but like I want to write on that show. I want to write these little things. From these weird little from what age would you say that? Probably like fourth grade. That's so young yeah. to have targeted exactly yeah, what you ended up exactly. doing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And now I don't know if I, I like, uh, you know, we're all submitting packets for SNL or whatever, but that's, I, would, I wouldn't say that's the one I'm most excited about. Right, Lauren you, Michaels, if you're listening, <laughs> don't, well, still hire me, please. No. Is it because of the climate of the show right now? or No, I think it's just because I, I've, I've grown enough to know that I would probably want to try, my next thing, I'd want to try to write like a, more of a sitcom. Sort of yeah. Thing, or reoccurring characters. So you've really changed, like, <laughs> fundamentally <laughs> from your work. Yeah, I would you, say. You used to really want to write for SNL, and now you would maybe take a job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, don't tell Lauren. Uh, no, we, I don't think he's, he's going to listen to this. I don't think he's going to listen to Dream this. Dream big. Dream big. Dream big that he's Lauren gonna, is going to. He's going to listen to this. I don't think Lauren listens to <laughs> WTF. <laughs> Nobody listens. Nobody listens. Maren WTF. talked about him incessantly. Oh, good. <laughs> Did you do theater? No, I didn't do. I had very bad social anxiety. But and there, there isn't really like. Did you have any way of like doing the thing of like writing skits or sketches? No, I, I did. I did write in high school. I wrote for our like little newsletter thing. I'm sure if you looked, you could find my my English teacher would submit me for some kind of little magazines. Whatever. So you were getting like uh, good feedback from writing. Yeah. At that mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. And what was your extracurricular life like in general? I just did art stuff. Like, I 
I, I still really love drawing and painting and stuff. I don't really do it anymore. So that was a big part of your life? Yeah, I would say that's what I thought I would, I was going to do. So can you, can you speak to doing that kind of stuff? Like you drew and you painted and mm -hmm. what kind of stuff would you draw and paint? Um, I, I was still in high school, so it wasn't, it wasn't really anything very meaningful. It was just, I was learning how to draw. I, I was one of the few kids that in high school took like nude modeling classes. So I really did want to get good at it. Does that mean I, there is a nude model? In yeah, the class? yeah. No, not in the school. Like we, like a couple of high schoolers oh, okay. Outside. went to a place and they were always like very elderly women. <laughs> Imposing. <laughs> Which are the hardest to draw. Because they've got so many like so many lines. So facets, yeah. Yeah. Imagine an old woman's feet. Oh, yeah. Just think they, about it. They're probably beautiful, though. I think if they're you're drawing lovely, them... But they're like, not easy the to draw. Veins mm -hmm. and... Are you putting color into these feet? Mm-mm. It's nope. just black and white. Mm -hmm. I, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> they do it out here. You can go do some nude modeling. You can be the nude model, or you can... Or you can draw them if you want. I did. I tried drawing nude models in college, like in a, a class setting. And I found like the hardest thing was that my teacher kept saying to me like, no, Ben, you've got to look at them. Like you can't just like eyeball it and then like yeah. go to the paper. Like you need to be really drawing what's there. Well, I'm looking at and their I felt, penis. <laughs> it, felt, it, just felt very, it felt like kind of awkward to me. That's but. where your butthole is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it sounds like you were fine based on what you're saying that was right now. Great. <laughs> Oh, oh, I know what's in there. <laughs> I'm so glad you never became an artist based on well, I would have what a had, terrible I had monster you sound Very like. funny drawings. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it would it would just be like a naked person and then the words, oh, your butthole? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably sound pretty close to that. Written in like graffiti? Yeah. Okay. Um, what was your social life like in high school? Um, I was really afraid of everyone, especially boys, um, but I had a very small, close-knit group of people who I loved very much and who were great. And who you're still friends with? Mm-hmm, yeah. And, uh, I think that's, pro that's like all you really need, but I do wish that I had been more social and less afraid all the time in high school, that, and I could have, you know, like, had fun and talked to people <laughs> and not, you know, not been cowering in the corner. So... But, you, you, would you, what category of like click do you think you fell into? I honestly don't think I fell. I can't think of one that I would have fallen into. Uh huh. Little weirdo girls. So, and you didn't date at all because you were no. afraid of boys? Mm -hmm. No, I dated. <laughs> I met the, a boy at church camp in like West Virginia or something, and I ended up dating. Oh, this is so stupid. I ended up dating him oh, long distance for like two years. Um, and I think part of it was because I liked the idea of, like, having a boyfriend, but not, like, having to, like, deal with a boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, like, far, like, I'd get the nice phone calls and everything, but I'd be far away and I wouldn't have to deal with them. So I was also, like, very scared of sex and all that because of the religious stuff. What ages did you have that boyfriend? Like, f 15 to uh, 17. And the creepy thing now that I realize is that he was... 20, I think, and I, when I was 15. Oh, wow. Um, which, at, when you're 15, you're like, that's cool. But then, as soon as you become 20, and you <laughs> think of your other 20 year old right. friends dating a 15 year old, you're like, oh, that's gross. Yeah, you have way less respect now <laughs> right. for those 20 year olds. Yeah. But pretty cool for when right. you're 15. Right, that was pretty cool. <laughs> it wasn't a very sexual relationship? You no. Said? Mm -mm. I mean, it, like when he would visit or whatever, but it was like few and far between. Uh huh. It wasn't on a daily basis. I was very, like, very scared of getting pregnant, so I, I would back away from it as much as possible. Uh, and it's good. You should be afraid of getting pregnant when you're a teen. You shouldn't do that. Don't get pregnant. You said that you've like changed a lot, a lot. Yeah. Like what you're just basically like from yes being eighteen to now. Yeah. What are other like differences? At, from Lauren at 18. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm a thousand times more confident. Like I feel, I still have a little bit of stage fright. Like I have, tr I have a little, you know, I get really scared before I do improv, but I can do it. You don't like, seem like you're scared before doing like a new money thing. Are you inside? Yeah, of course. I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little. Not bit, secret horse. No, not secret <laughs> horse. Cause I'm hiding. I'm hiding under a desk. 
but uh, it, I guess it's it's if if I know that it's written and I can just memorize the lines, it's also a lot easier than if I have to go up and make it up on my own and get all frozen up. Uh, but I know, yeah, I avoided all that in high school. I avoided any kind of public speaking classes. I avoided drama. I avoided any like I just wanted to take drawing classes where I could sit quietly <laughs> and draw for a long time. So you're so much more confident. Yes. Any other kind of things? Um, I'd say that's the main one. I'm I'm more social, and I realize now how like how much I need it. Like I I love talking to people. If I couldn't, if you said tomorrow that I couldn't do comedy anymore, I would want to do something where I got to chat with people all day. Like yeah. I love it. Uh, I can I can talk to strangers, which is a big deal. I used to never be able to do that. I could barely look people in the eye. Uh. So, yeah, what's interesting about that is, like, I, I think that when people are more introverted growing up, mm -hmm. that typically they also kind of, like, don't mind it, but you sounded like you minded it a lot. Maybe, I don't, don't know if that's true of most people. I don't or think like, I minded it that okay. much at the time. So you wouldn't categorize yourself as being, like, sad growing up? I would. I would. I could, but it wasn't about, like, oh, I'm not social enough. It was like a deep internal sadness, which is real. This is a bummer podcast. I'm giving you a bummer podcast. No, that's true. <laughs> I, uh, this is what I, I want to know the truth. Well, I I don't know. It's hard to describe. It's like Sarah Sarah Silverman talks about it in her book. I don't know if you've ever read it, but she talks about like just no for no reason feel like feeling a deep sadness all the time, and not and like there's nothing your parents can do about it. I mean, I should, my mom put me in therapy, and that helped, but when it's like that level of sort of genetic kind of depression there's nothing you can do until you like get treated for a chemical imbalance yeah because you really don't think there was any cause no i it. don't no i don't think i have any kind of like repressed memories or anything i had a really good like pleasant nice childhood my brother was fine <laughs> my brother turned out fine and i'm seeing it again with my younger sister who also has a great life but she also has these issues where for no reason, it's just some kind of internalized anxiety that she just gets. And I'm like, I feel for her because I know exactly how that feels. I think it helped having an older brother who was like kind of insensitive, you know, who would be like, you can't not go to school. If she doesn't get to go to school, I don't have to go to school. Because <laughs> it would force me to get out of it. But my younger sister is like an only child kind of. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really hard for her to like push herself out. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you still feel like you're struggling with being sad or, or with depression? Or? I think I'm relearning how to do a lot of stuff. Like, I'm, well, like stuff that I didn't get to do when I was a kid or didn't get to do when I was a teenager or whatever, like have friends go to parties and stuff. Like, it's a whole relearning experience because it, I was didn't start getting treatment for anxiety until, gosh, I want to say like, 2007 or 8. Wow. Uh, so, since that point, when, like, it, it doesn't, when you first start taking the medication, it doesn't, at least for me, it doesn't work for about two months. And you're like, ah, fuck this. This <laughs> fucking sucks. Uh, but then after, after it kicks in, you're like, oh my god, this is how normal people feel all the time. They don't, I guess, the best way I can explain it is that I felt like I was in fight or flight constantly. Yeah, that sounds so bad. So if I'm just, like, at school sitting quietly, it's like my heart is racing as if a beast is chasing me. That's the best way I can, I can explain it. Yeah, but that's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the beast is gone. I take medication. It's great. And I, you can enjoy parties. I can enjoy I love them. I love talking to people. I love talking to new people. It's great. I'm really glad that's Yeah, <laughs> me too. That's very, very cool. Uh, did you apply to a bunch of colleges or a couple? And I did apply to a couple art schools, um, and I got into some of them, but I also knew that it was very expensive <laughs> and not necessarily, um, the best for getting a job. And I don't, my family is not rich or anything, so I had to think about that kind of stuff. And the school that was willing to completely fully pay for everything was New College of Florida, a little tiny liberal, art, liberal arts school, uh, which was 
really great and a great experience, except they didn't have any kind of writing classes or really any kind of creative classes, so I did all academic style stuff when I was there. It was more like a general liberal arts college and Yeah, you were it was doing... like you either like delve deep into philosophy or biology or whatever, like in your So did you have any focus? Yeah, I did psychology. Psych okay. Yeah. So I do Was that your major? Yeah. I do know quite a bit about that. Uh uh, I think the mentally ill tend to go toward <laughs> toward uh, uh, psychology to try to cure themselves. You feel like, did that give you, like, extra, uh, like, intuition towards, like, the people around you? It did a little bit, but I ended up mostly um, kind of concentrating on, uh, co like, um, like, animal behavior, the animal behavior realm of psychology. So I did, I worked at, at Mount Marine Center with the manatees. They train manatees there to uh, take little hearing tests and little visual oh. tests and stuff. So I was there and tr I helped train them. And then uh, I ran the the lone. I was the lone beekeeper for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Did my thesis with honeybees. I had to be the beekeeper because I needed to keep them alive so that I would graduate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess it didn't. Right. Really that's every up. everybody has that in college. You yeah. gotta keep a bunch of bees alive to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. That'd be a, a good test, <laughs> um, but I, it did make me really a really good dog owner. That is, I would say, good. it made me an excellent dog owner. My dog is well trained <laughs> and happy. So when did you start writing in a big way? Um, when I moved down to LA, I took a job with a a girl named Eva, who and I was her like her aide. She has cerebral palsy and is nonverbal and was in a wheelchair and that for two years I was her aide so I would like do basic stuff around the house but also like help her write because she was a writer and I think I learned a lot from her in terms of writing she was mo mostly writing articles about disability and stuff but I was like oh man I get this I understand how writing works yeah and so but you know I didn't want to write about disability or anything uh so then when I left that I did that for two years to save up money and then I, I knew that I always wanted to take a UCB class, but I was really scared. <laughs> but after I quit, I was like, you quit, so you got to do it. And I did it, and it was terrifying. I took the, uh, my one-on-one -on -one class with Nick Weiger, and I remember sitting in my car outside being like, oh, you can go if you want. Like, you don't ha like, I got there early so that I could sit in my car for 20 minutes and convince myself to stay. <laughs> and then I wow. did, and then it was the greatest. That's great. Yeah. Had you moved out to LA to like try to be a writer? No, like, that kind of, I thought I would go to graduate school out here. Well, and uh, why LA and California? Um, I, Russ and I, my my long term boyfriend. Who you had started dating in college? Yeah, yeah. So he he had moved out here for college, and he had stayed in Florida for two years while I was in college. So that I I knew that when I graduated, I would go out here, uh, and work for a while, save up money for graduate school was the plan. But then. Graduate school is terrifying and expensive, and who knows if I want to um, raise bees for the rest of my life. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're still kind of thinking about it? Well, I have the skill set. You're right. I think you've moved on. Yeah. Uh, I could, though. That's the point. Like, that, I have a skill good. I can fall back on, which is beekeeping. That is good. Mm -hmm. um, I never got stung. Not once? Not with one all those time. bees? Mm -mm. Never got stung. Why do you think that is? You had a real connection with those bees? Um, bees are very friendly. People don't realize. Really? Yeah, they don't want to sting you. They die. No part of them wants to sting you. They'll only sting you if you accidentally smack them or something. I like all your friendships with bees. <laughs> it's very nice. Yeah. I did develop a kinship with them, I feel. <laughs> I like that they're all female, and I like that they have a whole little society, and they don't fucking need men. <laughs> It's funny, they, the way they, they do produce men so that the queen can mate, but then um, once the queen has mated, they just push all the men out <laughs> of the hive and they won't let them back in, and then they die. So the men, we, if you see a bumblebee, yeah, like, a, flying around, it's a honey always bee. A, a, a honeybee. A honeybee is a female. A honeybee is always going to be a girl. I mean, you a could woman. see a boy one, a male one, but... Uh, it's unlikely because their lives are so short. Right. Mm -hmm. And he is, he's likely just been pushed out mm -hmm. of the nest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and feeling really terrible about mm-hmm. himself. Yeah, yeah, he's got a complex. That's why that Seinfeld's A B movie was very inaccurate. They don't have little families. Get out of here. <laughs> They're youth social. They have one queen. They have a queen that rules above all else. And if you were just, just like our society with yeah. Beyonce. <laughs> Above all, everybody She's else. the queen bee, and we are all subservient to her. And who's been pushed out? Um, any haters. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> How, were you comfortable right away in that Nick Weiger class? No, no, no. It took a while. You, so what were the first couple of weeks of doing that like? Oh, they, I mean, they were still fun. Like, I realized right away that I was going to like it. But uh-huh. I also understood, I was savvy enough to understand that what I was writing was not good and it's frustrating when that happens I mean it still happens when I write I start writing something and I'm like never isn't good <laughs> it, it's gonna happen for the rest of your life if you're a writer that's yeah. part of the thing can so. you speak to what were some sketches you wrote in that class that weren't very good <laughs> oh boy I wrote one about like because I had recently been to one of those restaurants where you can eat sushi off of a human woman wow um it was a very weird experience. So I, I wrote one where it was like a Craigslist ad for a big, big hairy fat guy <laughs> that you can eat sushi off of. And it was not good. <laughs> I'd like to go back and see if I can make that good now. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sure you could. I want to see that in a... Yeah, maybe I'll... Maybe that's something Upcoming I'll show. I think that would be a fun show to do where you where you, t- you take an old sketch, you, you read... The original bad one, and then you revamp it, and you perform that, the revamped version. I think that'd be a good show. And I feel like that's what happens in the writer's room, like, just naturally. is like, we all bring sketches that are, like, not perfect in, mm-hmm. or, like, maybe not so funny to start with, and then figure out the way to make them good. Like, I think that's like, the point of them. Like, do you feel like you've had any sketches that that's happened with recently? Yeah, um, I had Creep Files. What was Creep Files for people listening? Creep Files is a sketch that still has yet to be performed, but hopefully will be soon. It's about a department of women who have a, who run a community service where you can call in and report creeps in your area. <laughs> and there's a creep file for an, and any woman can look up a man's creep file to see if he has one. Uh, so it's and and everybody who calls in is sort of pretty specifically talking about things that guys do in the improv community, like. <laughs> call in and say, hi, um, I just, I wanted to see if, um, this deserved to be in, uh, in a creep file. Uh, I was in a class and the guy kept trying to initiate me going down on him over and over again. So, oh yeah, ma'am, please put that right in the creep file. <laughs> give, give me his name. I'm going to transfer you over like that kind of thing. And it didn't start out that way. I think I, I started out a little too zany and everything and, and like, creepy examples but that would never happen in real life and then when I brought it into the room everyone was like no you the examples that you gave from your real life are way funnier so why don't you use those and then when I did the whole sketch turned around and it became instead of like a sketch about cartoon creeps it became a sketch that was like relevant to my community at least I think yeah that's very cool yeah I feel like I had that recently too with a sketch I brought brought in that was like about a kid in high school asking a girl out on a date, and um, when he realizes like she has a boyfriend, he changes from like asking her like her, her boyfriend sidles up next to her, and he's like saying like Will you go with me to the dance? And he switches to saying like to the t- Tony Danza convention, and originally like that was the whole game was just that he kept on like covering in that way, mm-hmm. and in the writers room. Uh, <laughs> People, like, just pointed out how, like, creepy this kid was actually being. Yeah, annoying. Like, by be- yeah, that he was, like, not a likable character in his persistence. And now the sketch is about him being completely called out and, like, him, like, not taking no for an answer but keeping on going, like, how much, like... How, and specifically, I think it's how there's a notion in men where it's like, well, if you don't win her heart the first time, just keep trying. And it's like a sweet little love story. But that's not, from the woman's perspective, it is not a love story. To wear a woman down by asking her over and over again if she'll go out with him on a date when she's already said once that she's not interested is so horrible and annoying. And I haven't seen, I haven't ever seen a sketch that points that out. And I thought that that was what made that sketch really great. Yeah, it made it way better to have it be a 
<laughs> sketch about that. I want more feminist sketches. <laughs> I, th I think if our th those two sketches were in the same show, my sketch and your sketch, we would have just we would have we would have changed the world. People would have walked out. <laughs> change. I the hope, creeps would have had their heads I down. I truly hope people would walk out. That would be my ultimate goal. If if a bunch of dudes walked out, because it means to me that they are recognizing that this. Here, them being called out is making them uncomfortable. And if you're being called out and you're that uncomfortable about it, it's time to do some fucking soul searching. It, it really helps because, you know, I grew up watching Family Matters and seeing, like, Steve Urkel say, I'm wearing you down, Laura. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, Steve he really... Urkel is a fucking <laughs> dick. Steve Urkel is a dick who needs to shut his mouth. <laughs> I'm so sick of everybody thinking, oh, he's such a fun little character. No, he's a fucking asshole who won't leave this girl alone who doesn't have any manners or respect for her. Yeah. It's bullshit. And you get the wrong idea. Yes, it's you're so a, an... annoying. I hate that shit. So our new comedies need to have a lot more of Urkel shaming. Urkel shaming. Shame Urkel. <laughs> I hate Urkel. <laughs> I like Stefan. Oh, Stefan Arkell would never do that. Stefan would never do that. He would respect a woman's uh, uh, answer the first time. Yeah. And that's why Stefan is exponentially always going to be better than Steve Urkel. Don't be a Steve Urkel if you're listening out there. Don't do it. He's not cute. He's a monster. <laughs> so what was the rest of your path that brought you to getting on new money? You took that Weiger 101. Took the Weiger 101, um, which he, I later heard, after I, many years later, I had heard, uh, I was talking to him and he said that he thought I was a little bit of a sassafras in his class. Whoa! And are you aware at all of like being that way? No, or? my God. I think probably how, how scared I was might have translated um, into defensiveness. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure now thinking back on it, that's what it was, but... After he told me that for weeks, I was like racking my brain, like, "Oh my god, I can't believe he thought I was a sap of grass." <laughs> uh, and now I, I worked with him, and he's so nice. I love, he's he's a he's a true genius. He's a he's his brain is incredible. You think he's gonna be like a Judd Apatow someday? I, I, I think he's gonna be totally different than Judd. I think he's gonna be different. But like that and level of yes. success. He's gonna have his own show that will that is something like you've never seen before. I'm not sure of it. There's nothing I'm more sure of. I love his um, Gungan style sketch yeah. that goes off in that crazy direction. Yeah. Is there like a thing that you've seen him do that is especially? And just like everything, because he a, does is really incredible. Because he does work on the show. He He's, well, he doesn't currently work on the show, but he worked on it last uh, like last block. He's now I think he's back at Funny or Die or something, but. Uh, and he was just very fast to watch. He's very fast, and he has I can't pinpoint it but it's, there's this cadence a cadence of a person on like a bad home shopping network channel that they, they speak in in the tone and rhythm and sort of punny way um and i I'll, I'll never be able to capture it as long as i live but it flows naturally from his, his mouth it's incredible <laughs> that's really cool yeah if you ever look at his Facebook posts, like his like semi-serious ones, you know the the ones like where he's like, "I'm gonna pitch a movie idea." It's the exact cadence of that that he just. He, it's incredible. Yeah, he's amazing at capturing that. Yes, it's such a specific thing that I don't see anybody else do. <laughs> so Wagner thought you were a sassafras. Yeah, I mean maybe I am. And then, <laughs> no, I think you're right about. Um, like that, that I really like seeming it. timid can yes. come off that way. I, I know think, that I, know, I had. I know that Allison, when I first met her uh, on New Money, she yeah. thought that I was a bitch. Oh really? <laughs> and they were best friends. But didn't she have that thing too, where like she was kind of timid at times? No, she also a... comes in hot, thinking everyone's a bitch. I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of assumes everyone's a bitch, and then you have to prove her wrong. But, that's a um, fun stance. Yeah, I think that's a great way to look at the world. I just Everybody's I'll a bitch. assume you're a bitch. bitch. Prove me wrong. Yeah. Prove to me you're not a bitch. Bitch until proven unbitch. Yes, exactly. That could be the name of a of a, a, a short film. <sighs> I do with like I have no greater wish than to just like naturally be a big bitch. Like, I <laughs> you... <laughs> wish I had that in my heart to just be. As I think life is so much easier. Life is so much easier when you when you think not only think but you know you deserve everything. Yeah, but you don't have that natural. I don't have that. I think I deserve nothing, and I should be groveling on the floor for every opportunity I get. So like, 
I mean, it makes me grateful, which is which is great. And, it and a much more good, appealing person. It makes me a nice person. <laughs> but there, there's something so easy about a life when you just assume that everyone should give you everything. Yeah. That's got to feel great. That has to feel For sick. you to be that person, that's a less fun person to hang out with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't be hanging out right now. I would be no. in Malibu sipping pina coladas. And with be, my millionaire boyfriend. And you'd be pushing me out of the hive. Yeah, I'd say, who's this jerk off? Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to meet your jerk off boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wiger was 101, and then what happened next? Oh, I had um, Eric Scott, who was also really great. I don't see him around very much, but he was, he was really great, too. That was the first time I did Shabby. Um, I, I did that Sushi Man one. I had someone that was willing to do that for me because I didn't have to be in it. I saw it. You no, you there. didn't. Are you I was, serious? I was in that shabby audience. Oh for my god, that I'm man. so sorry. And I, it didn't go great. No, it didn't. <laughs> it wasn't good. But I remember that very well, and I remember and and at least people did react a little bit to like the visual gag of it. Yeah. I think it's kind of amazing that I was at that shabby. Oh my god, I'm gonna throw up. <laughs> That's so embarrassing. It was a hairy guy. Mm-hmm. That guy was kind of hairy. A little bit. Yeah. Do who's the? Do we know the guy? <laughs> yeah. Who's the guy? <laughs> Should I say him? I remember being like Patrick Fizakerly. He was in my two hundred one class. And he <laughs> oh, that's to crazy. And then I did one of his. So it was like sometimes. There was so much thing. sushi. Right. I bought a lot of sushi for that for yeah. such a bad bit. God. Where the? <sighs> now that I know that you've seen that, I feel obligated as a person to bring it back and make it good because I feel <laughs> yeah. so bad that you saw that no please bring it back it would be beautiful no it wouldn't it would <laughs> <laughs> It'd be beautiful to fix it yeah it would be well, the circle of life that's the whole point is in the beginning you're supposed to do yeah. a bunch of stuff that's bad I had a real did, you have a, did you have a bad one can you make me of feel course. better right now yes. by calling me a bad yes. one yes I can okay. um I did a <laughs> I did one that was all pirates this it sounds kind of embarrassing but it's all pirates I'm like they are, like they keep on making like R R puns, okay. and every time they make an R pun, they get splashed with water. Okay, that makes me feel a little bit that's better. A, yeah, that's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot to that. Oh my goodness! You should it, feel honestly, a lot better. That that sushi one wasn't that long ago. In the scheme of things, that was like it was pretty. It 2010. Was like, yeah, four five years ago, six years ago. Ooh, shows you you can come far far in five years yeah but oh so after 201 i think the most important thing that i did after 201 was i started not i started but it's we started a sketch group out of the class and it was a couple people and we were all bad and that was fine but we met every week and we brought one to two sketches every week and I kept doing it, and it was like a personal, just like a personal thing to me to like, I need to prove that I can do this. So, um, we even did a spank show and everything. Um, I can't even, I honestly can't even remember. Oh, I had a video in there and some other sketch. How's your spank? Not good. Not good at all. But that, did, I mean, did it get fair notes? We didn't get any notes. Okay. Um, actually, I think we may have gotten notes, but it was just like, it was bad. I think it was right around the time when Neil was was switching out of AD. Right. And he, um, it, the notes were like, didn't get this one. I don't understand this <laughs> one. This one's kind of funny. <laughs> like they, yeah. Like, like not elaborate notes. But that's from fun. your future yeah, boss. It was fair. Yeah. 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 Well, I think he, I, if I recall correctly, he said two of mine were at least pretty funny. Oh. <laughs> so I didn't get the ones that you didn't get at all. That's high praise. <laughs> uh, but the I think the beneficial part was that we we about that spank was not the actual spank it was that we hired a director who helped us shape our sketches and i was like oh this is great this works really well when you have a professional <laughs> telling you how to make your sketches better yeah and so by the time mod uh mod packets were due um i had a tons of sketches to choose from and 95 percent of them weren't good but five percent of them were passable so I submitted, and I th I think it probably helped too that I'm a girl, which kind of sucks, but it's kind of also awesome. <laughs> it it might have helped or not helped, but you're like one of the best writers in That's the very, community. Very nice of you to say, because I don't <laughs> always feel that. I don't ever feel that way. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about how you were then. All I know is now, but that's definitely true. 
Oh, thank you. Um, you're welcome. It's a fact. <laughs> I feel that way about everybody on New Money. I truly feel that everyone is like the best writers I've ever met. So was was getting on New Money like the first like really cool success thing that happened to you? Yeah, in LA? for sure, absolutely. And right oh, right before that, I I was like so desperate to keep writing sketches and stuff and to just like have that have videos up that I joined I found a Craigslist ad oh my god this is horrible but <laughs> I found a Craigslist ad for they wanted sketch writers for a sketch group and it was called brevitytv.com you can still go to it and they're still making god awful sketches <laughs> um but it was just it was it's garbage for pay no, no pay. So a Craigslist ad for like, please give us your free sketches please so we can do our YouTube yeah. channel? Yeah, and to me at the time, because I, I don't know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, oh, well, then it's like I'm getting something free out of it because they're going to make my sketches. But the right. actors aren't good. The Everything about it is bad. It sounds close to a Craigslist their, scam. Their sense of humor is bad. We got into an argument about what, what funny is. <laughs> like I got into an argument with like the head guy. Being like, this isn't funny. <laughs> Do you remember his point of view of, of what funny was? He liked some like, epic dress? rap battle. Oh, okay. Like, that's, he wanted to be the next epic rap battle. And I was like, oh, that's not, what you're describing isn't a sketch comedy. Right. And then he said, I know what sketch comedy is. I've been doing it for a long time. And I said, okay. Well. <laughs> and then I left. Um, but not before getting a few very bad things on writing for some of the characters that they had already established. I wrote a couple very terrible videos for those characters. You, you were doing that at the same time as New Money? No, right before. Okay. Once I got on New Money, I stopped that. And how did, did, did Wit, it's called, what is the radio show you write for? Wits. Wits. That, mm -hmm. that happened during your first year in New Money? First or second. And yeah, how did that, that happen? Al, Al, they, he actually reached out to Allison Augusti at I think she knew that she needed a partner because she wouldn't, if like it was just up to her, she would put it off to the last minute and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very punctual and I'm like, ah, oh, we have to do it right now. So we were good partners for that because I, I made her stick to her guns and we would pop out some fun sketches for the radio, but it was very, it was different. This show has a very different tone than the kind of stuff I like to make, but I did get to write two really fun sketches for Maria Bamford and two, and a really one, one that I'm still really proud of for Kristen Shaw where she plays a hamster who's on the run and like I'm so proud of this and so happy about them That's and I actually did one first for Scott Ackerman before I ever started working for him wow yeah how are you feeling about your like the general state of the world when of your like world in LA when you got, like, in that first year on New Money? It, well, that, I feel like, changed everything. Because I, when I moved out here, I didn't have any friends. I lived with my boyfriend, and so I kind of adopted his friends. Um, but I didn't have any of my own. And that's just important for me and my own identity, to have my own friends that I make. And it was like, oh, my God, you're putting me together with six people who are going to be my best friends. They're going to be my best friends. And we're going to do stuff together all the time. We're going to hang out. This is great. And it really, I feel bad when I hear about other teams that don't get along. Cause I'm like, fuck, we're lucky <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. for all the minor things that like minor complaints that we have. It's like overall we have what I would say is the most talented possible group that we could have been given in terms of acting. They're so, our actors are so brilliant that it astounds me that they are that they're willing to do this and not go be millionaires <laughs> yeah because they could all be millionaires right now some um, of them are getting there i truly believe that will that every single one of them is going to be tina fey and like <laughs> it, it, it's crazy yeah yeah me too and then the writers are i've never met writers that are jobbled so quickly and i think they made me so much better because uh, they held, you know, it was like holding everyone to a higher standard of like, especially Kyle, because when Kyle would bring in these weird ones, I think he, I think Kyle influenced everybody because he was bringing in weird stuff that we had never seen and then everybody kind of wants to do weird stuff that feels new and, and different and I think that's kind of how we ended up doing these weird plays. He might have colored the voice of the group. Cause I think the, he might have, yeah. I think more than some other teams, the group has always had like yeah. a very distinct voice. Well, of. the thing, too, and the thing that when I coached Tut, I told them, was that 
when I read your sketch, I should know immediately whose it is. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to look at the name on the top. And I know for I know with 100% certainty if we had a writer's meeting tomorrow and everybody bought in new stuff, I would be able to tell whose is whose. Absolutely 100% certain that I could do that. And I think they'd be able to tell which one's mine and which one's everyone else's. Yeah. And that's great. Yeah. That was like the main, that's the main thing if I ever teach at UCB that I want to impart is like, you need to have a voice distinct enough to pick out of the crowd that I can tell you apart from everybody else. And that's how I feel everybody on New Money is. Um, do, were you having a hard time like with money at that point? Or yeah, like... I'm, I'm super frugal and like almost to a fault. And so um, I had saved up a lot of money from those two years. I worked nonstop for two years full time. So I had a good chunk of money saved up and I knew that I could live for two years with my current, and I also lived Those two in, years were when you were working as an aide? Like, at, when I quit. Okay. When I, yeah, right. yes. You I, had all that money saved up. I had all that money saved up from working for those two years, and then I knew that that money was enough to last me for another two years in my extremely cheap room that I shared with someone, and, like, I didn't spend any money on anything ever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... Uh, but I was just getting to the point when I it was depleted. Just getting to that point right before I got Wits, the Wits job, which was a lifesaver. Just in terms of my own confidence and financially. Did, and did that pay like a full salary that you no, could no, no, live on? Yeah, no, but we would sell stuff. and Like you sell a pitch. Uh-huh. So we, you know, you'd get like a thousand bucks for a sketch. Which oh, is, that's cool. Which is great. And sometimes you get two sketches in and they're, they're filming them every other week. So that was really, and then they would buy like little, sort of like the equivalent of tweets. Like they wanted to have these little one-liner jokes and they would buy those for 20 bucks a pop. It was great. Yeah, that's amazing. So, uh, and you know, it's a lot, it's different than what I do now where I don't have to like sell pitches exactly. But, uh, and I I like the way that I have it now because you can be a little bit more loose and creative and bring it to the room and everything. That was the only bad thing about that was that, it was that show tapes in Minnesota and there's no room to bounce ideas off of. So you're going in cold. Uh, but it was a really good experience. And I think just the act of getting paid to write was a big confidence booster that it was just like, Oh, Hey, look, I can, this is possible. <laughs> this is possible. And can you just like, what is wits for anybody who doesn't know? It's a, a show on, uh, Minnesota Public Radio, but it's also out here. It's on Saturdays. And it's like a sketch style show where they have celebrity interviews and a musical guest, and then they do sketches with those guests. It's a lot different than writing for a new money sketch because it's radio. So part of the appeal is that I can make somebody a turtle or a hamster or a space alien, and I don't have to justify it with a costume. Yeah, that's great. But also, you have, you can't, there are certain things you can't do. You can't do any physical comedy. I mean, obviously. Right. <laughs> you can do something falling down the stairs by doing that sound effect. Right, right, exactly. But it's probably not as funny. Well, it can be <laughs> funny. It depends. But yeah, it's like, it. I kind of compare it to Prairie Home Companion a little bit, but I think Prairie Home Companion's for old fogies. Uh-huh. I find it very boring. And this is on NPR. It is on NPR. Um, the thing with it, it... it it was just tonally very different than what I'm used to. It's, I still, I'm, as I said before, I'm still really proud of the sketches that I wrote for that and the jokes that I wrote for it because I was able to weasel my own, weasel my own um, perception into it or my, or what, what is the word I'm looking for? Voice? I was, yeah, I was able to weasel my own sort of voice into it and have ridiculous characters. But now when I listen to the show, it's mostly like, Peanuts characters having existential crisis and stuff. I just like not really my sen- my sensibilities, but yeah. Stuff for a little bit of an older audience, I guess. That's how well, that's how Prairie Home Companion feels. Yeah, a lot. I would say it's, like a younger, a it's, it's a younger it's a younger audience than Prairie Home Companion, but right. it's not that much younger. Right. Yeah, it's still Midwest Min- Minnesota moms, so they're not. Gonna, they're, they're not going to like all my butthole jokes. <laughs> We tried, Allison and I tried so hard to get a character named Doug Turd 
in there and he would not let us. He would not let us call it Doug Turd. That's a good fight to put up. I'll fight till the day I die for Doug Turd. <laughs> I get tired of hearing that sentence. I hear it so <laughs> often. <laughs> you hear, I'll fight till, the, till my death for Doug, Doug Turd. Turd. <laughs> yeah, it's a, something you hear around the office a lot. So... I did name a character in Bang Bang. <laughs> Doug Turd? I named him uh, Bra Fart Cream Jeans. Oh my god. And that was the, the happiest I've ever been. <laughs> <laughs> to see that it did not get cut from the final. <laughs> the final that might end up being the cut. happiest day of your life? Yeah. it didn't. No, I know for a fact it didn't get cut. I'm so pleased. <laughs> That's my one joke that I'm the most proud of. It's not even a joke, it's just a dumb name, but I love that name. It's pretty great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's a big deal. I'll probably get an Emmy. <laughs> uh, so you got onto Bang Bang in 2013? Yes. But you were not 20... a full... 14. 2014. Yes. But you weren't a full staff person. No, they brought, first. they brought me on as a freelance consultant, which is when all of the episodes are already written, but they don't know who their celebrity guests are going to be until... A, you know, a week before they shoot. So they need people on board just to write bits and jokes for that celebrity. So I did that, and uh, I loved it, and it was great and fun and stupid. And I got to go, like, most of the time, you're just down there watching them do the interviews. It was so much fun. Um, was it blowing your mind a little bit to have that job when you had it? Yeah, absolutely. I, oh, my God, when I got the I was out, uh, out to dinner with some friends from out of town when I got that call and I went outside and almost wept. I was so happy because there's nothing that could be more fitted to exactly what I needed at that moment. Yeah. And they knew about you from UCB? That's how they found yeah. you? Yeah. Well, Neil, because Neil was the artistic director, mm -hmm. he's the one that put me on a mod team in the first place. So he was just, Thank yeah. you, Neil. <laughs> Thank you, Daddy Neil. And you had submitted like a packet to become a writer and then they, that no, was No, he just, when he we just have consultants you. come on, we just pick buddies of ours. Um, and I think, too, it, um, Eva Anderson, who was writing on the show, moved on to go write on uh, You're the Worst. And I think they were like, well, we're a bunch of dudes. We need a female voice. And thank God they did because it got my damn foot in that door, Yeah, which is great. How have you felt about that being like the – how many women are there now? It's um, you and how many? Yeah, just it's me. You. It's just me now. And it's I'm, been mostly just you. Like Gilly was there, like very, like well, briefly. When I wrote the actual full episodes for the first twenty episodes, there was another girl, Emily, and she is so funny. She's great. Uh, and then when we moved on to the second twenty, I was the only girl, and it does feel weird. It does feel weird because. I don't know, there's just, a, like, we, when we had, uh, we had Jane Becker come in to do, who's, like, a, an amazing, hilarious lady writer, we had her come in to do consulting, and the week she was there was just like, oh, I can talk about The Bachelor, I can talk, like, I could, there was so much more, like, just, like, the dudes are always, hate to stereotype, but they're, they're talking about hockey all the time, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. It was nice to have somebody in there to to talk to just lady to lady. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, this, I, shouldn't, I should say that a presence the entire time that's been very important is our writer's assistant, Caroline Anderson, who is amazing and incredible and just a wonderful person. That's very cool. And who's, I think, good enough to start writing on the show. She's great. And she really hopes that happens? I think she's not sure exactly what, she, if she wants mm -hmm. to write or or a producer, what she wants to do, but she's she's just a joy. Do you ever have to, like... I think the other... Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. I think the other part that was hard... Uh, harder about this last 20... I mean, n not any less fun or anything, but a little bit more difficult was that everybody else... Um, was there, They were already buddies. Like, mm -hmm. they've been buddies for a long, long time. Not that I'm not buddies with them, but, you know, like, they've known each other since college. So you're just coming into a lot of, like, oh, there's a lot of inside jokes I don't get, you know. <laughs> but whereas the previous 20 episodes, we were all new at the same time. And so right. we all are bonding together. It's just a little bit different. It's a little bit of a different dynamic. Um, and they were both fun and great. 
but it was an interesting it was interesting to see the difference yeah do you feel like you ever have to keep them in check like with the like dudes? You, yeah like you you aren't thinking about like how this sounds not really no they're all really aware of that stuff that's cool yeah. so they're very progressive yes, guys yes, yeah. And... yeah no we don't have to worry about that too much uh and so is scott scott is really like don't make any let's not have a a feminine male character come in like let's not do that let's not you know like that's nice yeah to, it's great <laughs> be in a place like that um that's also just like that i don't think they think that kind of stuff is funny anyway it's not like oh there's a lady in the room we have to be on our best behavior they just don't think that stuff is funny which is great because i agree <laughs> <laughs> i also don't think that stuff is funny and and sometimes i do think stuff is funny that could be offensive <laughs> and i feel like yeah, I mean, if I think it's funny, let's do it. <laughs> right, you're <laughs> you the exact a, line. Yeah, if you if if you want to call if you want to have an old lady character on the show and call her old bitch, like, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> and you're I giving like everybody that. permission for it. No, I don't need to give everybody permission. I just <laughs> I think if we're all laughing at it. Yeah. And is old bitch a new character on that show? I would love for it to be. <laughs> I would love to play old bitch. No, I'd, I'd like a real old bitch. Okay. I wouldn't want to play old bitch. Yeah, I'm sorry that you're never going to... Hey, when I'm old. Oh, you will be old bitch. I've, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have my own sitcom. <laughs> oh, oh, that old bitch! It's kind of like Mama's Family. Yeah. How how confident do you feel right now about like your career going forward? Like, Do you get afraid of oh, the all future? The time. Or do you feel... I'm so afraid all the time. And why? It feels to me like you're in a very secure place. Yes, I mean, I love Bang Bang, and I'll stay on as long as they let me. I love it. Um, but, yeah, it is, like, I've written a, a, a pilot with Kyle, and I really like both, or all three of the pilots that we wrote together. Uh, but I do, there is something to be said for having your own pilot that you've written by yourself. Mm -hmm. And trusting your gut and not needing somebody to tell you that this is okay. <laughs> So just working, I guess working on my own pilot has been a priority that I just haven't had time for. And it makes me feel bad because it's one of those things like, everybody have a pilot ready, have a pilot in your back pocket. And I don't have an agent and I think it's partially the reason I've been afraid to get one is because I, I have to go write that pilot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, now, and I feel so much more confident, it's crazy, I feel so much more confident when I'm writing with a person or in a room or whatever. If we could all write pilots together in a room... Yes. We could all write our own individual pilots, but we had a room <laughs> for it to pitch ideas off of it. I think it would be much easier. But that would be fun. To go sit by yourself and be like, I'm funny. I'm going to write down all these characters, and I think they're funny, and this is perfect. <laughs> like, it, it's just you have to make so many decisions when you're writing a whole world. It's, it's very, very hard. intimidating. Uh, but hopefully, when you have that done, it'll be a no brainer for an agent to yeah, take so. on this person <laughs> who's already been working professionally. Yeah. Um, where do you most hope you are five years from now? Like, what would be your dream? Mm, that's a good question. Um, and you can shoot for the stars on this. What? <laughs> you know what I really like is I really like directing. I like directing a sketch team. And I, I've been doing it for a year, and I just really like it. And I do, I've only done it for stage, but I think my goal is to learn how to do it for film and to start doing that. What kind of things would you most want to direct? Any, I mean, shows and, like, I, I, a huge dream would be to direct an episode of Broad City. Like, that would yeah. be in the, in the perfect world. I would direct an episode of Broad City. Like, and I, I feel like there's something in me that's like, you could do this, you can do this, you just need yeah. to learn the technical skills. You should tell them you want to do that. Yeah, I mean, you I know the, you know, the right I know to enough directors to. now that I think I could just be like, hey, can I shadow you? Yeah. Or something. That'd be amazing. Know. I'm sure you could say that to, like, Lucia. Yeah, right? Stoney or something. But I, I know it, it was a surprise because I didn't realize how much I'd like it until I started doing it. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is really fun. Like, getting what you want out of actors and, and setting the scene and setting the mood and I just, and like, taking someone's work and making it shine that much brighter because of the way that you've arranged it is like it's such a good feeling it's like yeah that feels very 
difficult to me personally. Yeah. I think it's cool that you have a knack for that. Uh, I was nice to you to, of you to say I have a knack for it. I don't know that I have a knack for it, but I want to have a knack for it. But you I feel like you have it. gotten indications from like Tut when you were directing them yeah, I that think, you were a good director and that, yeah. And I actually and I did just see Tut shows yeah. getting great while you were the director. Yeah, so. I think they got a lot better. And that was cool. So I think that's just a big goal of mine in the next coming years is to learn how to do that and to really start and like whatever like I don't care what I start with like if I write a shitty five episode web series or something and then just do five like direct five shitty things by the time you're done with those five you're probably gonna know slightly more than you did before so guys I'm turning to the <laughs> microphone now to impart a message to you if you want to do something you gotta go out there and you gotta fucking do it Great message. Yeah, that's the message. If you think you might be good at something, you got to give it a try. And if you don't, you're going to be sad forever. <laughs> that's true. I do feel like my, my dad, um, I think deep down he would like to do improv and stand-up. Like, he admires it and he loves it, but I I think he's, he's rightfully uh, uh, scared because, I mean, who wouldn't be scared? But it's like, dude... If this is what you think about all day, you got to just jump in and do it. It's the scariest thing in the world, but then it won't be scary anymore. you got to keep saying that to everybody. Yeah, I tell myself this every morning in the mirror. <laughs> really? <laughs> hey, buddy, don't be scared. Just go out there and you do your thing. <laughs> You're a boss-ass bitch. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Old bitch? <laughs> You're a boss old bitch. <laughs> no, you're just a boss-ass bitch. I'm a boss-ass bitch. Um, thank you for... Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Ben, for uh, having this me. This was great. And giving me this beer. Oh. Uh, but ben got me drunk. No, be, uh, don't drink. I'm going to drive now. <laughs> well, I'm going to get her an Uber. It's, be, it's Ben's fault. Uh, if if I die, it's on Ben. It's, well, I, look, the record show, it's not. Uh, in, my, in my will, it says that um, uh, everything goes to Ben. So if really? I die, you're, it's going to be really suspicious. Not what I thought your you. will was. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I won't call it either. <laughs> well, I've been dancing on purpose. Because I know I will feel the glow. I am a metaphor. Searching for more. Hachimachi, that was my interview with the delightful Lauren McGuire. If you want to see some sketches written by Lauren perform live, you should come out to see a new money show. They happen the second Wednesday of every month at UCB Sunset in Los Angeles. Again, if you want to hear more interviews with awesome people like Lauren, consider subscribing to On the Cusp, and I will try not to disappoint in future episodes. Special thanks to the band Hi Ho Silvero and Casey Trela for all the music in this episode, to my sound editor, Joe Burge, and to my producer, Cece Iken Has Bitcoins Pierce. This has been On the Cusp. That's your outro music.